Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last webinar uh, of the series of the ATBC webinars. This is the last one, which is part of the Frontiers in Tropical Biology and Conservation. Uh, the title of our webinar today will be Climate Change, History, Environment, and Society. At this moment, we've been through uh, two different uh, webinars, one related to the structures and uh, functioning of uh, tropical systems. Hello, everybody. Uh, okay, I guess everybody can see me now. Okay. So I was, as I was saying, this is the third and last one webinar of our series in Frontiers in Tropical Biology and Conservation. Uh, we started with the structure and function of tropical ecosystem. Uh, we then talked about biotic interactions in tropical system, and today we will we will be talking about climate change. Uh, I want to tell everybody that today uh, the webinar is for, for uh, members of the ATBC. However, uh, starting on the 30th of October, this webinar will be available on the YouTube channel, the ATBC. My name is Gabriel Colorado. I'm a counselor of the ATBC, the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation and co-chair of the Climate Change Thematic Group. I'm also a faculty member at the Department of Forestry Sciences of the National University of Colombia, Universidad Nacional de Colombia. And I'm based right now in the city of Medellin, Colombia. And my co-host is Eva Oliveras. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. So I'm Imo Oliveras. I am a counselor of the ATBC, and I am also a co-chair of the Climate Change Thematic Group. Uh, I am based, I'm a lecturer in ecosystem sciences at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. And together with Gabriel, we chair this climate change thematic group in, within the ATBC. And it is the main reason that we wanted to organize this, this webinar to call the attention of climate change as it is one of the most disruptive forces in the contemporary era. And it's shaping the environment, the environment and also questioning the way humanity has approached the use and abuse of resources. The, the, despite the vast amount of lit literature in climate change produced from both the natural sciences, efforts in coming to terms with climate change from a multidisciplinary perspective are yet much needed. So in this webinar, we are presenting a discussion on climate change from three scientific uh, lenses. First, from the perceptions of Am Am Amazonian indigenous communities on climate change, Second, on the climate variability in, in a different time scales using novel tools uh, to interpret changes in, in the terrestrial ecosystems. And lastly, how social sciences are needed for a more comprehensive understanding of global environmental change. Hey, thank you very much, Lima. So before I introduce you to our first speaker, uh, let me go to some really quickly basics for our logistics for our webinar. Can you see the instructions? Okay. If you could put it in, in presentation mode, please. Sure, yes, thank you. So microphones and viewers are now activated for the webinar attendees. Attendees will only we be able to see the speakers and moderators. This is uh, a very important part of the webinar. Uh, every question that uh, all the attendees have must submit it through the Q&A, the question and answer tab, which is located on the main screen. Uh, the questions will be read and addressed uh, after the three talks, by the end of the three talks. And we will be moderating this along with Ima. Uh, the chat only works for panelists, and if anybody has any inconvenience or any technical inconvenience, please use the email that is written below in order to, to try to solve it. So, I'm very proud to, to be here with my three colleagues who are going to be talking today about different topics. Uh, the first one is named Juan Alvaro Cheveri. Juan Alvaro has a PhD in anthropology from the school for social research. He's a full professor at the Amazonian campus of the National University of Colombia. He is a specialist in native Amazonian indigenous populations with work and research experience in social anthropology, 
general history, traditional knowledge, linguistic documentation and revitalization, indigenous education, indigenous territories, and in the watering in the Amazon. He's also the author of the book, Cool Tobacco, Sweet Copa. And uh, we are all very proud about this because he just recently received the Alejandro Angel Square Prize, like the our, uh, Nobel Prize for Colombians in Environment and Sustainable Development, along with Oscar Roman and Murui in the group. And today he's going to talk about the perceptions of Amazonian indigenous communities about climate change. So uh, I want to welcome Juan Ambaro and please share your screen with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriel and Ima and all the organizers. I'm just going to share my screen again. I hope it shows. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, actually, I'm going to speak about the climate change and perceptions and effects of indigenous peoples. The information I'm, I'm going to present actually was collected about 10 years ago, but uh, it was very useful to have this chance to talk about this because currently we are working with an interdisciplinary group. We are working with a group of uh, Facultad de Ciencias, I mean, for biologists and other students and professors about, uh, we are dealing with indigenous ecological calendars, uh, which have been produced by, by our, our idea is to take take them seriously. I mean, uh, there has been published a, a lot of indigenous calendar, but sort of a folkloric thing, let's say. But what, we do, what we're doing is correlating the information in these calendars with meteorological data, with ecological data, phenology, uh, uh, identification of the species, fish, uh, mammals, etc., and health issues. We want to see the correlation, I mean, the, the flow of the year in relation to these things. <laughs> and one point I want to make, you, I want to make two points in this talk. One is uh, that the effect of climate change on natural life and indigenous people's livelihood are not simply related with increasing temperatures. Uh, which had have the most media effects, for instance, the fires in Brazil. The most perturbing are the slow onset effects derived from changes in seasonality. And the second point is that the actually indigenous people have accumulated and sophisticated knowledge about the seasonal calendar and its ecological indexes, which can help us understand much better uh, the impacts of global change on, on such a complex ecosystem such as the Amazon. Okay, here are some premises about climate change and indigenous peoples. Actually, I took this, I mean, this is like the, the common sense. This, it was the, the terms of reference of a call of the World Bank for a consultancy on climate change. So I just copied them and they say right at the beginning, indigenous peoples have been greatly affected by climate change while they have contributed the least to increase greenhouse gas emissions, okay? Second, indigenous peoples hold traditional knowledge on strategies involving adaptations to changing habitat and resource conditions, including impacts of climate change. And third, indigenous peoples are not fully included in the global climate change dialogue. Okay, uh, one generalized perception I obtained from interviews with several indigenous peoples in the Caquetá, Igara Paraná, Putumayo, and Amazon rivers is that there has been evident changes in the weather, particularly seasonality since the 90s, and thus that these changes have been more ostensible since 2005. Now, what science says about climate change threats in Amazonia? I mean, this is, these are the postulates uh, derived from the uh, global circulation of 
in the planet. So these are general predictions. So they predict in this century an increase of two to eight degrees Celsius in temperature. Several models predicts 20% decrease in precipitation and greater in dry seasons. Uh, deforestation and forest fragmentations create a positive feedback loop producing phenomena such as the droughts of 2005, 2010, and recently the fires in Brazil. And various models predict that much of the Amazon will become savanna and bare soils. Okay, good. Now, what perception do indigenous people have? Just a summary. Well, one important thing is that more important that, that than an increase in temperature are the alterations in the seasonal rhythms, alteration of dry and rainy seasons, and alteration in the pulses of the river. Second, uh, indigenous peoples are very conscious of certain ecological indexes. For instance, that wild fruit crops are, are not do not appear in the right season. Uh, basically, the coupling of phenology and seasonal cycles and also changes in the wind regime. Summer trade winds from the Atlantic are the southern cold winds. And now it's some limitation of, of the, those predictions. I mean, the general predictions I read two slides above. I consider that uh, it's very difficult to model local effects from these general circulation models because they are mediated by complex physical and ecological interrelationships. And I will try to show a few of them. Second, climatic data on the region uh, has very little historical depth. So we have some basis to compare. And as particularly, there are very, Amazonia is not homogeneous at all. I mean, there are important differential effects on a east west axis. Uh, so the east of Amazonia has lower precipitation, the west has higher precipitation, and north-south axis, the climatic hemispheres, which has, there are different regimes. So let's look at this. Uh, okay. The overall predictions for the Amazon as a whole, however, have differentiated effects according to the range of natural, cultural, and social variation throughout the region. The Colombian Amazon, which is shown here, this is Colombia, and the southern portion of Colombia, is located on the northwestern portion of the Amazon basin. It is a region of high cultural and natural diversity, and the vegetation cover is much better preserved than in other parts of the Amazon. So on the one side, it is located on the western part of Amazonia with greater precipitation. And it is located uh, on the intertropical convergence zone, which has two climate regimes. You can see here, the two degrees south is more or less the climatic equator. And you can see here, I just place to, this is the precipitation of, on Araraquara, uh, two degrees to the north of the equator, to the equator, and Leticia to the south. You, you can see that there's like sort of inversion of the pre pre precipitation regime. And we have, uh, so, so Colombian Amazonia is mostly located on the Northern hemisphere, and so the Venezuela Amazonia, and most of the Amazonia, that is, Peruvian Amazonia, Brazilian Amazonia is located in the south. So much of what has been said about Amazonia is predicated on the southern hemisphere. And we can see even contrasting effects that when there are droughts in the southern Amazonia, in Brazilian Amazonia, there is rain in this northern part. So we cannot generalize. So next, I will present the main perceptions and findings of recent changes in the climate, especially in the aspects of temperature and seasonality. Then I will discuss the main direct effects of these changes on indigenous livelihoods as perceived by people. And finally, 
I underline that the impact of global climate change in this region can only be understood and evaluated in conjunction with all other social changes that affect the region. So let's begin with temperature. Well, temperatures appears to be like one of the main indexes of climate change. So the, the global models, model says temperature will increase up to 10 degrees plus. Uh, so first, temperatures in the Amazon have an annual cycle of variation with lower temperatures towards the middle of the year. As you can see in this graph, this is for Leticia. This is an average uh, from the 60s uh, to now, and, and which correspond, I mean, June, June, July correspond with the winter in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, so this is the, the time when they occur what they call in Portuguese free agents in the cold season, a limited number of days with low temperatures. I mean, low temperatures in this region means 16, 14, uh, sometimes 18. This is the temperature with the high humidity, it, the sensation of coldness is high. Uh, so I, here I compare the blue uh, straight line is the average of all the, the data of temperature for the Leticia. The, the dotted line is the 2000, 2007, which you can see clearly that you don't see like a, like a tremendous increase. And I, I added the <clears throat> this red dotted line is for 2005, which was uh, the year of the drought in Brazil. So as you can see that that year in particular was high. But now let's, let's look at this. Let's see if you can see clearly. This one, these two graphs are based on daily data. Daily data, uh, so, and we, uh, we try to establish the outliers. I mean, days that, uh, here's the formula. I mean, uh, outliers in the data, outliers in hot days, and other layers in cold days to see if we could detect the free agents. And you can see that very clearly towards the middle of every year, more or less, you see a few days with coldness. I mean, all with this outlying temperature data. But you see that here that there is one, there are several. And also you can see the yellow lines, I mean, means outliers hot days. What is interesting here is that it seems that in recent years, I mean, it comes to December 2018, that the hot days have tended to diminish, uh, contradicting in a way, I mean, that the temperature is the main index of climate change. And just look, and this is for three other uh, stations located to the north, or these three stations are located about the equator line, I mean, two degrees above the climatic equator. Uh, you see that this gray, this, this shaded areas, I mean, days with, uh, with no data. You see, I mean, you see the regularity of uh, the free agents, the cold seasons, and also certain concentration, or especially hot days or some some parts. Okay. Now this, mm, this, this, the annual succession of seasons is the, of the greatest importance to indigenous peoples. And this cold season uh, is uh, particularly what marks the beginning of the year. The indigenous people of the Cacatapa Tumayo, uh, which is in Southern Colombia, conceive the annual cycle as established by the father creator since the beginning of time and are well aware of the ecological and ethical foundation of this cycle and the adverse effects of its alteration. To illustrate the meaning that the indigenous people give to the annual succession, I present here a summarized version of the ecological calendar as is traditionally supposed to occur narrated by the indigenous people of the Nunuja ethnic group. You can see here uh, that the, the, the beginning of the year is the big free agent, which is the time of uh, 
Moriche Pan, Moriche Plexuosa, is precisely when the river and the rainy season is the highest point. I mean, the river levels are this line here, and this is the uh, precipitation. Then, okay, a second. This, this moment of cold is conceived as the menstruation of the air, and also at the same time as a fertilizing man. I mean, it's el preñador, it's called in Spanish, el preñador. This is the moment when the, these cold winds are infusing fertility in the in the in all the plants, and it's called the menstruation because these high, uh, the high waters, when they descend, they are going to uh, to pull out to the river all the all the filth and all the rotten leaves, etc., that uh, are under the forest. After this, after this season, there comes a period marked by the succession of rain, uh, little dry days, and then rainy days. And they're called summers, small summers, which are marked by the phenology, by the, by the uh, crop of certain fruits. And then this is called the season of worms, when the forest is full of worms, and there are thunderstorms, time of illnesses, the river descends unevenly. And then here in November, the sandy bars appear uh, and then comes the big summer of, of fish palm, Bactris gasipaes. There come the winds from the Atlantic are the dominating winds. So you see here, the winds from the south in July and the, the, the trade winds in, in the in the in January, December, January. After that, there comes the rainy seasons, the production of, of wild fruits, and uh, then the river floods the varsias, and it is crucial for the reproduction of fish. The fish ascend the rivers uh, to eat the fruits that fell on the on the varsias. Then we give small free items, and then we, we will reach again the maximum river level and it continues. I mean, we, we return to the beginning of the chart. Now, on this basis, let's see some precipitation changes in the cycle. One is uh, rain, dry and rainy seasons. People say it rains when it shouldn't rain, it is hot when it shouldn't be hot. There is no longer a clearly demarcated dry season, it is hot but not windy. I showed those two little graphs, for instance, showing the great variation in precipitation. If you compare precipitation uh, for many years, for instance, you see in Araraquara, the, the blue line represents the average pre monthly pre precipitation, and you see the, the behavior of precipitation that year. In July, July August, it rained a lot, uh, and then it decreased. Uh, for instance, for Pedrera, you see the standard deviation. I mean, it shows that it's incredibly variable. I mean, it's huge. Standard, and you see, for instance, in 2005, in Pedrera, I mean, in the, when the, the month that was supposed to be the most rainy, is practically it's right below, and then it's up here. But let's see, because in the indigenous calendar, it is very important the orderly succession of great summer, small summers, so to speak. Uh, I, uh, supposedly during, during El Nino event, uh, you see this red triangles, I mean, it's a way to represent dry days. So if you, when you have a succession of days without precipitation, so the triangle begins to climb. So you have here like 30 days without rain. We have here 20 something days without rain. This is during the El Nino event. Uh, and here is during the, during the Nina event. This is interesting because they seem to be inverted. These empty spaces are days without data. Okay.
because river levels are uh, okay. I will show this one. This is one is interesting because I gather a couple of narrations about changes that people remarked in two thousand and five. There is this situation that uh, the river floods and then the fish come to eat the fruits uh, and, uh, up the, and then this, the, they hatch the eggs, they, they lay the eggs. And then if the river descends, they narrated that and this, this chart for 2005 shows precisely that the river reached a high level but then they, it descended too fast and all the eggs were lost, they say that. And the same, at the end of the year, uh, this is for the turtles. At the end of the year, when the, the sun bars appear, the, the turtles lay eggs on the beaches. It's normal that after that, the river increases, washes that, and then descends. There is a second posture of eggs and it succeeds. In this case, the river increased abnormally and destroyed the second position of the, of the turtles, okay. So, some immediate effects. So just to summarize, uh, the alteration of the rainfall regime affects directly the slash and burn of the horticultural system because this system is very well articulated to the existence of a long dry season, which allows to, to uh, burn the plot, and then a clearly marked rainy season that you plant and grow. These alterations have affected strongly that. Alteration of river levels affects the reproduction of the aquatic life, just as I mentioned. The alteration of phenology of wild trees, the reproduction of terrestrial fauna. And changes in wind regimes and phenology, human health, new diseases. Now, just to begin to conclude, I guess I I made this statement. I mean, we can classify the perceived effects of climate change into two broad categories: the dramatic effects, rains, extreme droughts, fires, floods. I mean, which are clearly perceived and generate institutional responses. And the slow onset effects, which are not so visible, which are derived from alteration of seasonality regimes, phenology, fauna reproduction, effects on articultural systems, which are not tragic or visible events, but has very deleterious effects on the natural system and the human reproduction system and generate new diseases and many other chaining effects. But uh, just to conclude, I mean, it's not only climate change. When the, we interviewed people about climate change, actually many things mixed. So there are many more effects, pl new plagues, migration to cities, weakening of authorities, well, so the question is what perceived effects on livelihoods are the effects of climatic change or other types of threats, territorial loss, advancement of the agricultural frontier, extractivism, increasing dependence of market economy, influence of mass media and education. Um, just to conclude, just these few remarks. Uh, scientific institutions and national and regional environmental authorities do not seem to be focused on understanding the local effects of global climate changes, and much less to establish this in dialogue with local knowledge. Rather, the whole concern seems to be to establish how much carbon the Amazon forest and wetlands capture. With indigenous peoples and local population, the issue is that of economic compensation for every forest, like this uh, red plus, etc. This compensation mechanism appears to be based on the idea that local populations are ignorant and poor. They do not recognize the 
practical and reactive knowledge of the people. Uh, they promote their incorporation into the market through the granting of economic benefits in exchange for the non-use of the forest. But in fact, what, if we, what we have is a sophisticated ecological knowledge that would, would help us to better understand the complex effects of climate change on the Amazonian rainforest. Um, that's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, and please uh, feel free to post your questions in the Q and A uh, tab, in and we will reply and do the Q and A session at the end. And now I am. It's a, a pleasure for me to present our next speaker, who is Catalina Gonzalez. And Catalina is an associate professor at the Department of Biological uh, Sciences at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota. And she leads the research group in tropical paleoecology and palynology. And with more than 15 years of experience, her research seeks to understand the long-term paleoecological and paleoclimatic history of tropical ecosystems from Northern South America and the result of the interaction of human societies, climate change, and biogeographic and geologic processes. And uh, her talk today, it's about volcanoes, uh, volcanoes and biodiversity in the Northern Andes. Thank you very much, Catalina. Thank you Imo, so much for your presentation. I'm gonna share uh, the screen, hopefully it works. Um, okay, here we are. Um, Can, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so thank you so much for, for inviting me to be part of this wonderful webinar. For me, it's a great pleasure to be in, in this fantastic group. For me, it's a matter of like very, like per, I have like, like personal reasons for, for being very like um, touched by the invitation. Um, and I really like uh, the previous talk because it, it gives a way to, to my presentation in a way. Uh, this is exactly what I would like to do in the, in the system I'm working right now, which are the volcanoes in southwestern Colombia. Uh, and you will be thinking that right now, uh, if the session and the webinar is about climate change, why is this uh, professor here uh, talking about volcanoes? So I, I hope I can... Uh, convince you that volcanoes are a great system to actually uh, study um, disturbance and and actually respond possible responses to climate change. So this is a picture, a nice picture uh, in, taken from the lowland Amazonia in Caquetá, where uh, all the uh, Juan was explaining just previously, towards the south, and that's the volcano, uh, one of the volcanoes in Ecuador. So just to, uh, to make the point that usually like uh, volcanic systems and volcanic impacts are uh, most of the time overlooked and like, um, yeah, it not taken into account when we are trying to, trying to describe like the impacts uh, on the environment and, the, and how to deal with, with change in our systems. So usually um, the Holocene has been uh, understood as this uh, magnificent period or interval when the climate was so stable that allowed human societies to thrive and to succeed. Um, so when we compare the temperature of the Holocene, the last 10,000 years with the previous like uh, glacial interval, we will see that actually, yeah, apparently the variation, the amplitude of the of the temperature changes are much lower and that we are moving in a relatively stable situation. And according to like uh, personalities like uh, the Sir David Attenborough in the last uh, Netflix series, um, the people are like mentioning um, once and uh, yeah, many, many times that, that, that uh, the Holocene was something like the Garden of Eden and that we, we are losing the Garden of Eden. This stability is no longer there. Um, so he, he's refer, referring particularly to the, the stability in terms of uh, temperature once again. 
uh, if you see the y-axis, the uh, temperature during the last 10,000 years has changed uh, maximum from mine, uh, like more or less 0.4 degrees. And if we compare those 0.4 degrees to the actual changes that are in the, in the order of 0 0.6, 0 0.8 uh, degrees Celsius, then we, we, we could agree that we are moving in, into a novel state unknown for, for us as humans, for species and for culture in general. However, if, if we have a look uh, once again, not to temperature, but to other climatic variables such as precipitation, the Holocene seems to be a stable word, but not that stable anymore. So here the, the axis, the X axis is time and um, it's, it's inverted compared to the last one. So the present time is here to the, to the, um, uh, to the left and the, and the last, the, the beginning of the Holocene is here quite at the, at the right. So if, if, if we see and we follow uh, like the changes in precipitation and the, the, main, the mean position of the IPCZ, uh, which uh, Juan was just mentioning before, which is the rain, rain belt bringing the most of the precipitation to our uh, northern tropics, then we will see that the IPCZ uh, has actually changed uh, and moved southwards during the last uh, few thousand years. And probably more important than the, the shifts of the ITZZ is the increment in the ENSO frequency. So the, the, during the Holocene, during the last 10,000 years, we have like a beginning of the Holocene with, with very few or very weak ENSO activity. And then when we enter during the last uh, 4,000 years, as we can see down in the, in the, top, in the bottom panel, we can see that actually the ENSO started to be like crazy uh, after around 4,000 uh, uh, years uh, before present. Uh, just to remind you, in this little map here at the, at the right, you can see that uh, ENSO has a very, is one of the most important mechanisms driving variability in, in climate variability in the tropics. So we will be talking about an area where ENSO has a differential, um, a substantial differential pattern in, nor in, in to the north and to the south. So in Ecuador, uh, the signal of the ENSO is completely of the, uh, of the precipitation anomalies is completely opposite to what we have uh, in Colombia, for instance. So we will be sitting in an area where we have strong uh, gradients in climate um, and we will uh, try to address instability and change throughout the Holocene uh, to study um, how, to, how to deal with that. So I will be talking about climate, but I will be talking about another factor driver of change, which is uh, volcanoes. So uh, just to remind you, we are sitting on this area where we have like a very uh, high heterogeneity in many, many as uh, the variables, uh, when you talk about like uh, geology and, te and tectonic history, you end up with a like a mosaic of terrains that result uh, from the um, subduction of the uh, Nazca plate beneath the South American plate and the Caribbean plate, and you end up with a very active, uh, tectonically active uh, region. Uh, Climatically, I already told you about the ENSO, but it also when you take uh, annual precipitation or winds, you will see that this area is also very, very, has very steep gradients. And this is reflected as a very, like, particular, like, biodiversity patterns and uh, with uh, incredibly rich, um, um, like, floras and faunas. And so we have almost every group you take uh, has a, a, an expression of very high diversity in this area. And in terms of cultural diversity, the story is more or less the same. You have in very small geographic areas, like um, a mosaic and a coexistence of different um, groups, society pre Columbian groups, uh, occupying the same space during uh, several millennia, but with different, very singular and different cultural expressions. So we have 
overall a great coexistence of singular and different forms. Um, so when we come back to the to like to, to the geological and, and um, yeah the, the singularities in the in the tectonic uh, realm, we come uh, into the, the a very specific singularity, which is the occurrence of more than twenty two active volcanoes occurring in very very small uh, ge uh, geographical space. Uh, to be an active volcano means that you erupt, you had an eruption at least uh, once in the last uh, 10,000 years. And it, for me, it's, it's strikingly it's, it's surprising how, how we biologists, how we, we forget, we often forget about the immense power that these uh, volcanoes have on shaping diversity, on shaping culture, on shaping like the relationships between uh, people and, and nature. So just a quick uh, remind that volcan volcanoes are not uh, all the same. They, are, they, they vary in size, in explosiveness. So we have very quiet, subtle, gentle volcanoes, uh, such as those from Hawaii. And we have very explosive and violent uh, volcanoes, such as those in, um, in, in Pompeii, in the eruptions from Pompeii, Toba, et, et, et cetera. Um, so we have a wide range of, of, of intensity. And depending on the intensity and the size of the eruption, we will have different impacts on, on, on ecosystems and, and, and cultural um, societies. So, and Another particularity and very important is also that volcanoes um, excerpt or, or design in the space like gradients related to the distance to the to the source. So if you are closer to the to the to the source to the volcano, then you will have stronger effects. And if and, and while you go more distant, then the effects change. So you have like a, a gradient with space uh, on the intensity of the effects. Um, so a volcano, depending on the size and the intensity, will have with bury by uh, ecosystems by by ashes and flows is changing the drainages, uh, is burning trees, is burning forests, is changing, um, is is for, um, like um, promoting a, a acid rains and lightning. Um, it's um, also effusing like toxic ga uh, gases and it can also have like uh, climatic impacts uh, in the near term and also in the in the long term so this specific topic is super important because for instance the the the, cli the mean climate states of of, of the last 2000 years has been um, before the anthropocene uh, it, it has been already shown that uh, climate has been mainly driven by by volcanic activity during the last two, uh, 2000 years uh, globally. So these uh, volcanoes in general might um, like uh, uh, cause like local extinction of populations or depopulations, but at the same time can form soil and add nutrients to the soil and promote recolonization and, and migration of populations and, and promote uh, succession um, of, of and renewal of, of the ecosystems. So in order to establish the, re the impacts of volcanic activity on Andean ecosystems, we, we first have to like summarize the, the volcanic activity and, and have like a baseline to compare with. So we, some, uh, this approach has like some methodological like difficulties because it's not easy to address this, the, the, uh, this issue. So we were thinking that maybe the paleo record can be helpful and, and uh, to search for, for past volcanic activity. So typically what paleocologists do is to look for an eruption specific one, look for a tephra, which is the ashes um, resulting from the eruptions and try to figure out what happened before and what happened after the eruption. But in this case, we, we wanted to change like the, uh, like uh, like the methodology, uh, because in not in every case we have the tephras. So we are very interested in trying to integrate like different time scales of uh, methodologically different time scales, and try to 
a link, establish a link between what we see today in the field in volcanic areas, try to link that to the paleo record. So therefore, we, what we did was to design in a way, let's just, just like a, a methodology in which we do like typical ecological studies with plots and, and moss pollsters trying to, uh, to trap the pollen and identify um, how to represent, how to have a, a instantaneous picture, a uh, Polaroid picture of the today's uh, volcanic ecosystems. Uh, and try to upscale that into the landscape. And then through um, narratives and interviews with the local people, try to expand the present day, like immediate punctual like um, view into a longer time scale of the several decades. So by interviewing like local people and trying to understand their, uh, all the knowledge they have on, on, on this uh, ecological succession after an eruption, we try to reconstruct the, like the, the natural trajectories of recovery after uh, a volcanic eruption. And then with that in mind, we go back into the paleo record and try to look for those successions and trajectories uh, into, um, in, in, into the data. So therefore we need like to look for very, very high resolution like records. And at the same time, we need to, to know when the volcanic eruptions happened. And at the same time to try to link it with the archeological data. So um, this is more or less the summary in terms of methodology of what, it, what we did. Uh, we can talk about it later if you want, um, but very important here is to I want to put some, I don't know if you're gonna listen to it, so please tell me if you don't listen to anything. <laughs> I will put this. Era... Are you listening? Mm, yeah. No tenía ninguna planta de nada, pues. No nada, había planta. Ninguna en el valle entero. En no había. ese... O sea que en esas canalitos, como les digo, cañaditas. Sí, ahí cañadita. sí. Ahí habían unas planticas ya. Bueno, ahorita las buscamos las de las y, y así a la parte de semita como estamos, no había absolutamente nada. O sea, era pura... De no había ni absolutamente... Era... So, era... for those that, uh, or you that don't, don't understand Spanish, this is Don Tomás, um, um, a campesino from, that lives in the volcanic area and reminds when he was a child and he's just... Uh, recalling and, and telling us how he reminds and recalls this um, succession of plants after the eruption that occurred like 100 years ago. He was not alive 100 years ago, but when he was a child, he came to a place that was completely bare and without any vegetation. So this information was key to understand and to start to, to figure out and to, to determine like this trajectory of succession uh, in this volcanic area. So according to Don Tomas, this is what we could reconstruct. And then according to that, we will look into that same pattern in the paleo record. So uh, to do the reconstruction of, of the volcanic activity, what we did was to collect hundreds of data uh, that we know that come from a certain eruption. Obviously, I, I didn't do that myself. We, we, know, we, we need to, to work together with volcanologists and geologists in this case. And we um, basically did like a summary of all the eruptions of these 22 volcanoes in the uh, North and South America. Uh, we re, uh, recalibrated the dates, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea is to have like a summary of the eruptions uh, in the area. And for archeological data, we did the same. We collected hundreds, like 700 data of uh, archeological dates. And then we, I'm gonna show you some plots that are a summary of like the archeological sites that in a way represent like um, a summary of the population uh, archeological uh, during like pre, um, prehistoric times. So this uh, 
just to show you, give you like an idea of how those volcanic data look like. Every color is a different volcano and you have, you now you see, and then in the X axis is time. So as you can see, every volcano has a different personality. Some, some are very explosive, some are very quiet, but they also are not erupting all the time. So there are some that are just uh, have like uh, activity once during the last 10,000 years and they there are others such as El Galeras uh, or Chimborazo that have erupted several times during the last 10,000 years. So it's just like a symphony of volcanoes erupting at different moments with different intensities and promoting this um, permanent uh, change in the area. So, and what we did was then to summarize all that vol vol volcanic activity. So for the whole area, this is the resulting uh, curve where you see that, uh, that volcanic activity seems to have increased during the last 5,000 years. So it become more frequent. We, during the last 5,000 years, we have been uh, as humans and uh, as ecosystems facing um, like volcanic uh, disturbance more frequently. The, the blue one is the, the summary for Colombia and the, the purple is the, on the pink is, is for Ecuador. Um, so this, now the, the, the interesting part starts here. Now when we compare the activity of the volcanoes with the human presence in the area, what we did here was to split the human archaeological sites into three main areas. One, uh, the, the yellow one is in the Pacific lowlands, the green one is in the, in the Amazonian lowlands, and the Andean sites, which are the sites more of them closely related to the, to the volcanoes, are in blue. So once we compare the volcanic activity uh, with the, the population on the archaeological sites, what we see is that, yeah, um, Pacific was uh, populated earlier than the, the, uh, the lowlands of the Amazonia and the northern Andes. Uh, and one very interesting observation is that uh, during every period when we had very strong er uh, like eruptive phases of different volcanoes, the population in the northern Andes declined somehow. But very interestingly is that the same didn't happen in the lowlands, the Pacific and the Amazonia. And apparently there was the opposite. There are some intervals of maximum uh, volcanic activity uh, that coincide with increases in population in the lowlands. So first conclusion is that we have a story of coexistence. People, people never abandon the place. They come back. They always come back, even if there is risk, even if there is a volcano uh, playing around, they come back. So this is very, very important. And secondly, um, it suggests that there is interaction between people in the uplands and the lowlands. Probably an option that has to be tested by archaeologists is that probably the people that abandoned the, the valleys in the, in the highlands moved uh, into the lowlands, escaping for a few years and then coming back. Again, so this is something we are working on. And a, a, a more detailed uh, comparison here is an example from La Cocha. Uh, La Cocha Lake is in Colombia. The, um, there is a, a, a volcano called Galeras nearby. This is only 20 kilometers away. Um, and uh, very interesting uh, is that La Cocha Lake has a beautiful, beautiful, very detailed palynological record. So, and that record has been always interpreted as climate, as like a climatic signal. So for, for, for years, we have been understanding like uh, the ecosystems of uh, Southwestern Colombia changing only by, uh, as a response to climatic change. But now that we decided to play around with the date, with the new data, we found out that the forest, the Andean forest, which are, represent, which are represented in green, are actually responding to the phases of volcanic activity of the Galeras Volcan. So uh, 
it's not a surprise. It's, they are so close that it's obvious. It's obvious for everyone that once you have activity in the in the galeras, then the forest and the nearby vegetation will respond, and we have like decreases, general decreases of uh, percentages of of forest when you have more activity of the galeras volcano. I have to say that the galeras is not super explosive. It's more of quiet intermediate uh, strength. And even more detail then we looked, since the record is that good, I, I didn't do the pollen myself. This is, is from another person, a very good palynologist. But uh, she, uh, she allowed, she gave us the data to compare with. And what, what, what we did was try to look for what Don Tomas suggested us that uh, how the trajectory of the succession was. So we, lit, we looked into the, into, the day, into the data, looking for the succession that uh, Don Tomas suggested. And what we found was that actually after uh, every uh, single like volcanic activity interval, we found the succession that Don Tomas suggested, low de Asteraceae, Aricaceae, Weinmania, Lycopodium, et cetera. Um, so there was like a confirmation that actually that trajectory um, was correct. And this opens like new possibilities for paleoecologists to look for volcanic activity uh, in the pollen records, even if we don't have the tephras uh, in the records. And yeah, playing even more with the data than we compare volcanic activity with the forest, with the human uh, activity and with the climate uh, and this is like the full orchestra comparison. And then what we found was that uh, human activity that is represented by spores, charcoal, and the archaeological sites um, coincides quite, quite well. Uh, it started uh, around like a uh, few thousand years ago. And that vegetation is actually responding to both factors like volcanic activities and people. And there's a very interesting like uh, interval here when Enzo uh, El Nino starts to be super frequent here around 2000 years ago. And this peak is actually uh, suppressing the, or, or yeah, um, suppressing completely like the human activity during this period. And we don't have volcanic activity suggesting that this uh, absence of humans during this period might be related more to climate than to volcanoes. So by linking the several lines of evidence, we can actually uh, start to understand this integrate, like in, intricate, in, intricate um, uh, relationships between humans, vegetation, volcanoes, and climate. So this is like our dream to come to, to something like this. And just to, to finish, uh, we are now in this uh, portfolio from Universidad de los Andes, a, a transdisciplinary team of people, archaeologists, sociologists, uh, engineers, geologists, etc., trying to understand volcanic Terri volcanic territories from a different perspective. So we, we, we believe that volcanic disturbance is resetting uh, all the subsystems of volcanic territories. So the cultural systems, the climatic system, the soil system, and, and, and the way that this uh, loop is occurring depends very much on, on, on decisions or on the memories of the system. And that we want to as, like, take this like, adaptive cycle as a, as a basis for understanding uh, like volcanic territories in a different way. So uh, we definitely belie believe that disturbance and response to disturbance and resilience after disturbance uh, is very much related to this integ integrate uh, relationships between human volcanic volcanoes and paramos. So we really uh, want to go deeper into those relationships through, tr through time and, and try to explore that uh, much better. So just to conclude, uh, this approach is allowing us to understand, look, to find like, and to pose new questions related to the, to the roles of volcanoes 
in promote and maintain diversity and how disturbance is actually, and the response to disturbance can be studied from the paleo records. Where are the memories of the system? Are the soils, the trees, the elderly people? Where is the memory of the system that it's allowing us to, 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 to do a new, uh, to, to a new trajectory of recovery? And uh, not only climate is driving change. Um, we we could see could see that eruptions are also important, but also other types of of disturbance. Uh, people uh, coexisted with disturbance for millennia, um, and this is also a very interesting thing to take into account. And uh, it was key to integrate local knowledge into this. Uh, ecosystem trajectory knowledge and to, to offer new insights into the, into the, the, the resilience of the system. And uh, yeah, we definitely need and want to uh, address these problems in a multi inter transdisciplinary way. So that was it. Okay, Catalina, thank you very much. It was a lovely talk. Thank you very much for given us this idea about the symphony of volcanoes and how they are shaping our surroundings. Thank you. So our next and last speaker, uh, I want to introduce Herman Palacio. Herman Palacio is a faculty member at the National University of Colombia. He's based in the city of Leticia in Amazonas. Uh, supportive by cold sciences, he started research on Colombian environmental history and published Naturaleza and Disputa as a collection of articles. His work led him to Said the main element to get his PhD at the Florida International University in Miami. Since 2008, he became part of the scientific committee of the International Human Dimensions Program for Global Environmental Change, based at the United Nations University in Bonn, Germany. In 2015, he got a full grant to work on comparative history of conservation between U.S. West and the Amazon region, particularly national parks and he has become a Fulbright Regional Ambassador in the Colombian Amazon. He has written recently on political ecology and environmental history of the Amazon, and his more recent book is called Territorios Improbables. And during 2019, he worked with the Commission of Truth, a Colombian agency devoted to study and understand the Colombian armed conflict of the last half of the century. So this afternoon, Herman uh, is gonna be talking about some really interesting ideas it's about the association between Anthropocene, climate change, and globalization. So, Herman, thank you very much. And please share your presentation with us. Um, thank you, Gabriel and Ima, to organize this. And also thank you to Catalina and Juan Alvaro for the interesting presentations that, in a way, give me the possibility to talk more in deep or in a different way, probably, to what they have been talking about. In fact, there are like a different, uh, let's say, intellectual approaches in a way. Juan Alvaro coming more from anthropology, and I think Catalina more from earth sciences, probably, or biology. I, I'm not totally sure, but but. As you can see, we are going to speak more or less of the same kind of central or key points like shared by the three of us, but in, in, in different ways. So hopefully this contributes a little to, to this attempt to put together and interact natural and social, social science. So that is why in my presentation is called this way, Challenges and Contribution to the Anthropocene, hopefully, fortunately, Catalina already talked about that, from the point of view of the social sciences. Uh, already, uh, Gabriel already talked about me and I am teaching political ecology and historical perspective. So that's the only one I want to underline in addition to what Gabriel right. said. Disculpa, yes. uh, no estamos viendo tu presentación. Podrías ensayar. Ah, yeah, sorry, sorry. It ah. says there is pause. Okay. Let me see. 
what happened with this. I am seeing it, but I, I thought that you have already. Let me see. Maybe you can share again because do you probably print? Should Maybe. I say new share? Yeah. Okay. Right. Now we can see it. Okay. So I'm going back, not to to go back to the presentation, but just to show to everybody how it start. I think that now it's not moving, it's the only bad part. Can you see? Uh, we're seeing the climate change. Only, only that part, but it's not moving. Yes. Sorry. Give me a little, one minute, just to see what is going on here. Mm -hmm. Team. Let me see if the problem is, what is the problem? Ah, it's because everything is, you see that now? Challenges and contributions? Yes, yes, Herman. Okay, yeah. so it's like moving maybe because right now it's in oh, yeah. it's the, PDF. the F, sure. yeah. so it's like moving this way. So this is the first and this is the second. So uh, I am just going to start uh, with uh, the topic of climate change and Catalina already advanced a lot of the most important part is that, that we used to live, scientists say, uh, say says, in a period that could be like 12,000 years of relative climatic stability called the Holocene and this climatic stability is also like the climatic context or framework of human civilizations that we know. However, climate stability of the earth has been assumed, but climate change scientists are proving that this stability is precarious. So I want to use an expression of someone coming from the social sciences, that is Karl Marx, that used to say about the capitalist society that has been transformed in the 19th century, used to say, all that used to be solid melts into air. Something like that is happening with climate change. We used to assume that stability of climate uh, was something perpetual. However, everything right now is moving. So some scientists, Paul Crutzen initially and Eugene Stormer, coined the term of Anthropocene. I am putting there like a, a connection with the Smithsonian in a very short um, slide a video uh, explaining very easily uh, what is the Anthropocene. We are not going to put it right now, but we are living in, in a new epoch. We move from the Holocene to the Anthropocene, and then it's related to climate, climate change. Of course, climate change cannot be just reduced to global warming or to changes in temperature as Juan Alvaro already mentioned. I, am what I want to show this uh, journal, very important journal, um, that is like the one that is completely devoted to develop the human interactions with the Earth system. This is the volume 31 this of September 2020. So, what I want to move is if we are in a new epoch called Anthropocene, so probably there must be something in geological terms that we could call Anthroposphere. So the earth is interconnected with different subsystems like atmosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, cryosphere, geosphere, biosphere, and 
anthroposphere. So that means that the anthropos, meaning the humans or the human species, has become a geological force. Something in a way, let me make the analogy, as Catalina was talking about, it's a sort of new volcano, big volcano, with the possibility to impact the whole earth. But right now, humans are like volcanoes, let me say, just to connect with the former presentation. However, when we talk about climate change, or normally we talk about global environmental change, I found that when natural scientists speak about global environmental change, they are not really speaking about the, the same kind of things when social type scientists speak about globalization. So during the 1990s, late 20th century, globalization was like a big issue in social sciences. But at the same time, natural scientists were talking about global environmental change. And you see like how they look similar, globalization and global change. So in a way, globalization and global change could be like a big long confluence between the social and the natural sciences. Of course, there are confluences, are important differences that we cannot overlook. Disparity about meanings and key components of the global. Global change, globalization. And this has been acknowledged by different people, Karen O'Brien, for example, Nigel Clark, Clark and I, I wrote with some colleagues of the University of Wisconsin on this same topic. Normally, when natural scientists refer to, the, to their global, they refer to Earth. But normally, social science refer to the world. It's just like a linguistic or whatever difference. My main argument is, is that it's more than a different in words. It, they are not just synonyms. As long as natural scientists have accepted that humans are the most important driving force of global environmental change, so natural scientists and the natural science are bringing into their analysis social sciences and humanities in the, into the discussion of global environmental change, and particularly of climate because natural scientists have an idea of the humans modeled by their own area of, of expertise, humans as a species, species, social sciences and humanities cannot accept so easily such reduction to the humans, of the humans. Humans are not just species, but one must talk about human society societies, social organizations, or social systems. So for social scientists, human societies are much more complex than a species, or whom humans cannot be defined just in numbers, in demographic terms. So let's compare what were the topics that used to speak social scientists related to globalization globalization. Normally they spoke about expansion of, of for, of for this capitalism in fin financial, productive, commercial. Normally they spoke about technological changes. Normally they, they spoke about cultural homo homo homogenization and also in legal and political terms some sort of globalization of the legal phenomenon and also of political organization. But people in the natural science that used to speak about global environmental change, speak about other type of issues. 
For example, environmental degradation and the limits of resources of the earth. For example, population explosion or the expansion of humans as, as a dominant species, biodiversity loss, climate change. So you see different kind of talking about more or less the same kind of things, but really referring to different kind of things. And who were the ones, the important people that really make, build the climate change discourse? These people were the scientists of the earth. Who are the meteorologists, climatologists, atmospheric chemistries, oceanographers, hydrologists, geologists, and later to biologists. Probably later, I guess, you can tell me I'm wrong. I'll be happy if you tell me that because I am speaking as a person that is not part of the natural sciences. And I am just trying to understand what are the connections between these two sorts of discourses, scientific discourses. And then we can move to one possible question of, the, of this um, distinguished audience. Is that an anthropocentric explanation of climate change or is an anthropogenic explanation? Climate change has happened because of human transformation of the earth. It would be more anthropogenic, this explanation. It doesn't mean that it has to be anthropocentric. I don't think so. So we have two tails of the global, and but these two tails of the global has to be put together or integrated or related or put in conversation. People from the natural sciences and people from the social sciences. But how can interact properly when they are talking with similar ter terms but thinking many times in different realities. However, if you think about part of the problem is we are like focusing on the global part of this discourse, but then probably you are too young, but maybe you remember that in the 60s and in the 70s, a lot of social movements were trying to integrate action. And they used to say, think globally and act locally. So that was a sort of contribution of social movements to the whole global change process. Both Juan Álvaro and Catalina told us interesting things about the relation between these global things or phenomena, but how they are they related to the local? Juan Álvaro especially is underlined the role of indigenous people. Um, also Catalina talk about how people in local context close to volcan volcanoes are like very important in order to know more about the behavior of the of the volcanoes and the and the human impact of the eruptions, for example. So what we have to do is try to put in friction what we call global with the local. And Singh, this is an anthropologist from Indonesia, for example, used to say, you cannot really fire, um, um, sorry, I forgot the word, like a phosphor, uh, someone help me with that. Phosphor. Match. I match, exactly. If you don't have the thing that let you really um, fight it, or you cannot move your bicycle if, it, if it, it is not on the soil. So in order to the global really move, it has to be put in friction with the local. Let me give an example not taken from the Amazon, but from the North America. 
I will say, and I am putting here a quote of Mark Twain, a very important uh, novelist from the United States, that used to say at that time, quote, one of the brightest gems of the New England weather is the dazzling uncertainty of it. So that is very curious. So when this guy was talking about the weather, he was not talking about some, what scientists talk about as that stability of the weather, but a really uh, like kind of uh, difficult to predict. I'm going to put another quote and you can read it because if I read it, you are going to suffer with my, my English. So you can read it, I'm going to give you like 10 or 15 seconds. And I'm going to underline only the last part. Please read it. So maybe you already finished to read it. I am going to underline just the last part. In the spring, I have counted 136 different kinds of weather inside 24 hours. And he was not top talking about the tropics. People that live in the tropics know that changes are really very like quick. So in a way, my point is, how really we can connect the global and the local. But sometimes the local perspective or the local experience of the weather or the climate, but the weather could be like different on how the scientists really think the weather is behaving or, sorry, in that case, the climate is behaving. So, Climate uncertainty, Mark Twain was, a, was talking about that. Really, he was talking about the weather, not exactly the climate. But there is no doubt that uncertainty has entered in the mindset of scientists. But to make sure that these scientists are really right, they have to develop technological instruments to really monitor the weather, but really along in the long term for the climate. So technical instruments were developed in the context of what is called the great acceleration that used to be a, a feature in the post, the second post war war of the post Second World War, late 40s, late 1940s. So it's curious, really the scientists couldn't really build like a really comprehensive discourse of climate change if they don't have these sophisticated instruments that you can see today in television normally when you watch the news and you see that the whole world moving and you see hurricanes and you see how the weather move like waves and go up and down, south, north, and so on and so forth. And it's the same context of the development of the nuclear and space race. And finally, the development of geoscience. But how relevant is the weather in every everyday life. I was trying to put an example of the local. When Alvaro mentioned that too, Catalina too. But let me say a little bit about my experience when I moved to the United States, to the North, Northern Hemisphere or to Europe. Never I was so aware or even worried to find out what was the weather. But when I moved to the North part of the US, of course, with good reasons. Sometimes in winter, if you don't 
notice how is going to be the weather you can die that is not what happened in the tropics you can live and maybe people in the in the caribbean with the hurricanes probably but not for everybody i never was so concerned in my day life with the weather but living in the north part of the world In tropical climates, they are not really so concerned. And never before I used to check news, and especially Colombian people maybe know, because these experts that go to the television used to make forecasts and predictions that never really happened. So they were very good to make mistakes. It was so changing perhaps, or maybe the instrument were not so good. But today, people living in the north or really in the, in the south of the country, but especially in the north, um, has to watch uh, weather channels every day or most of the time. So what I'm trying to show is that there are different ways to experience personally in local uh, settings, the weather and the climate and transformations. So sometimes, for example, when Juan Alvaro is, wa was talking about transformation, that yes, is happening in indigenous territories, you could say, okay, but that is a natural a change forced by natural climate, uh, climate transformation that is called variability or is more like uh, the push of the human action in a big scale. Normally, we used to talk about people in political sciences, used to talk about the Baron de Montesquieu because many people in, in, in the law schools used to speak about the spirit of the laws because Baron de Montesquieu used to say that governments were related to climate. And that is why in lowlands, according to Baron de Montesquieu, civilization really cannot prosper, cannot really develop. It's only in temperate climates. Even patriots such as Simon Bolivar, the big hero of South America, used to know and read Baron de Montesquieu. And when he wrote, he was saying that Nobody really should write about ideal republics, giving the idea that you have to relate the building of new republics and new nations to climate and to specific geographical conditions in where people live. This is more related to a, a very, let's say, deterministic idea of the relationship between climates and people that we are going to, to avoid. One thing is to try to make the connection and the other thing is just think that people is just the effect of some particular way or climate. In fact, the tropics were considered ugly, were considered in only be, is, they are like very unhealthy, uh, populated by people that is lazy, low races and unable to build Truly, truly civilization. So right now that I try to put these ideas and we have, we can talk hours about this. My final comment goes to this way. Who is the Anthropos of the Anthropocene? Because these natural scientists are telling us that we are living in a new epoch theological epoch called Anthropocene. So what is, who is the Anthropos? So the initial answer is a human species. However, these humans are living in social, economic, and cultural systems. And then they are not just an species. So should we call this new time Anthropocene, this epoch, Anthropocene, 
Or should we say, this is a capital of sin? Meaning, people living not just in a situation, in, 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 in the earth, but organized in a social system. And what is that social system? The capitalist system that, that is like moving permanently, expanding always, getting more raw materials to get more money, develop a very con consuming society that has to grow infinitely. And if, let me add this, and normally in that process of, of expansion, organizing wars and taking territories. So I will say that we cannot simply reduce the anthropos of the Anthropocene to a human species. In fact, people, when they discuss natural scientists, when the Anthropocene starts, so they will say in the industrial age, so they are saying not just that is one human species, but one human species organized in a particular way. Just to put the last example, this connection and how is intertwined um, problems that used to be studied by natural sciences are becoming really completely intertwined with problems related to humanity more in general. For example, a new field, I will postulate that we can call political ecology of religion. If you remember Catalina at the beginning of her talk, mentioned um, a very important scientist from Great Britain and mentioned about that the Holocene was like the garden of Eden. So the implication was something like the Holocene was the garden of Eden and we are saying Bye-bye, because climate change. This is the end. But when you mention Garden of Eden, you are doing really a religious analogy. Eden is part of the Bible. But you can say other people that are scientists are mentioned this name, Gaia. Gaia, a living organism which is the earth. Another kind, and Gaia, related to a divinity in the Greek and, and ancient civilization. But you can say, as normally in Bolivia, they say, Pacha Mama. Another kind of curious, sort of sacred, sort of religious idea. Or finally, the, the Pope Francisco speaking about Casa Grande or the common house. So the Pope is now also talking and intervening in this big field of dispute that I am calling political, political ecology of religion. Climate change is affecting relationships and pushing into the integration of natural and social sciences and also humanities, other human experiences. So now let me finish just with some pictures that are really at random for you. These are not ideas, but it's more like a collage. These are low carbon people. These are not undeveloped or savages or barbarous people. This is just low carbon people. 
people than to live and transform uh, the environment. They don't need to use a lot of energy like this human society that is the capitalist society. This is more like a dream. And this is a reality based in another sort of dream. And this is another one. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Herman. Um, yeah, I think that uh, that was a very uh, thought-provoking talk and I very much enjoyed it. So uh, without further delay, uh, we will open to questions and answers. Um, Herman, if you could kindly- I am, I am trying to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll... You? I, I, I closed my presentation. Yeah. Okay. I think that I can. Okay. No. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, we have, uh, um, I want to remind to all uh, uh, people listening to us that they can write their questions to any uh, of the panelists or all of them in the Q&A uh, uh, session. So, and we will start with a question to Juan Alvaro. And is uh, if there are serious studies on the government of whatever on the effect of cattle and logging in deforestation and precipitation, modifying regimes in the atmospheric rivers that in turn affect human, animal, and vegetable communities in Colombian Amazon region. Good. Okay, certainly. I said that the Colombian Amazonia is much better preserved in terms of the forest cover than, for instance, Brazilian Amazon. But the deforestation has been all in the western part, on the Piedemonte, uh, Piedemonte part of the Amazon. Six million hectares, something like that, the Departamento de Caquetá has been deforested. And the question is about it. There are studies by the government or whoever about that. I don't, I'm not aware of none. I mean, the, in certainly this rate of deforestation, I mean, is the, the, for the, you know, the, the winds that bring the humidity come from the Atlantic, from the east to the west. I mean, deforestation in the Eastern Amazonia is critical because it diminishes the, the flow of precipitation. And so we really don't know what happens when the forest is on the west. Something I can just verify very incipiently is that uh, the, the, the records of precipitation in the Florencia or up Putumayo and Cacata rivers tend to show longer uh, dry succession of dry days. So even though, I mean, uh, on, the, on the forested areas, Precipitation has alternation. So, really, I mean, there are no serious studies, and I just, not, I, I don't know what the effects can be about that in the, in the measure that it increases. And it's a real threat. I mean, the advance of colonization, cattle ranching, and um, uh, mineral extraction advances. So, it's, that's my answer. Thank you. Hey Juan, thank you very much. Uh, so I have a question for Catalina mm -hmm. on a, one of our attendees. And it says, uh, what is the potential role of soil and soil variability in modulating or amplifying ecological and human community responses to variable climates? For example, with volcanoes, essentially resetting soils every so often. Does this feedback to soil development and agricultural practices? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much for the one that posted it. Uh, yeah, I agree that soils are in the middle of, uh, of everything. So soils are crucial because not in terms of time scales that they are exactly linking like the human time scales and the geological time scales so in a way 
soils are the one, the receptors of, of climate, of humans, of uh, vegetation, of geology. So soils represent that memory of the system that, that, that is in, in fact uh, like uh, pushing the system in one direction or the other. Um, yeah, soils are crucial. Volcanoes have uh, the ability to, to facilitate uh, the formation of certain soils that uh, will sustain certain uh, ecosystems such as paramos, for example. So it's a, there's a direct link between volcanoes, soils, paramos, diversity, humans, that the loop closes again. So in a way it's, uh, yeah, soils are crucial. And there are plenty of examples, for example, in Polynesia where uh, the um, limiting fertility of soils related to, um, to volcanoes in a way pushed people away from the islands and, and, and and help into this migration of Polynesian afterwards. So it was apparently like a soil uh, low fertility, uh, the, like the tipping point that, uh, that pushed people away because fertility was not enough to, to support like the living in, in those islands. So in a way, yeah, soils are definitely, definitely crucial. Um, so and in, and it, they are also crucial and also overlooked into the uh, climate climate change uh, story because they are storing a lot of carbon, and uh, with the human practices, we are actually losing their capacity of of uh, retaining carbon and yeah sinking carbon and, and so on. So yeah, I would say yes, uh, they are crucial. And I just wanted to 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 make a point on on uh, an issue that I just noticed throughout the the talks that we often um, are like uh, in a way we are not distinguishing between weather and climate and it would be interesting to make the point again that weather is one thing and climate is another thing and that humans we uh, our perception is that we perceive weather. We perceive the sun, rain, storms, but in a way that is, is the mean or this average through time, what is understood as climate. So in a way we have to find a way to make the linkage between the two time scales, which is important also to, to note. Thank you. Thank you, Catalina. So we have now a question for, for Herman Palacio, for Professor Palacio. And uh, uh, Diego would, would want its criteria about putting in evidence that Anthropocene is a result of a point of view of the world of big economies that have effect in all the planet, not only in humans. That true is absent in dialogues and in the search of solutions to the problem. In fact, the corporations and people are strum deny and people like strum deny. What is your position about that? Okay, thank you for the question. Very interesting, but I'm going to start with Catalina was saying. I totally, I totally agree with the that we have to make clear that weather and climate is not exactly the same thing. That is why I was like going a little bit like in the middle of the two but I am aware of that and it's very important. At the same time, that is very important to distinguish between climate change and variability in change or in climate, I'm sorry, or climate variability. Uh, because what is what would be very interesting, like uh, thinking more, or more in the topic that Catalina was develop me, developing, is that normally like volcano as the El Nino is, is sort of, uh, climate variability, but the point of the discussion is how some factors, very important factors that are part of uh, variability climate or that phenomenon are like in or intersect with climate change and make harder or more stressing or quicker or whatever, more intense, no? And both topics are, of course, not for me but for probably like natural scientists that are really the people that are studying that kind of thing. My purpose was more like looking from the social sciences, how can I really understand what they are saying? And this, what I'm saying is related 
to the question that is a more political question uh, from Diego Campos. Humans are part of economy. So when a point, when uh, Diego says, is the result of a point of view of the world of big economies that have effect in all the planet, not only humans. So it, in, in the way that, that Diego is like phrasing the question is like making a difference between economies and the humans. And my point is that humans are part of these economies and essential part of these economies. But we cannot say just, or think in humans just as an species, but a, an organized species, let's say, in a social way. And then you cannot just leave aside or, or, or sim simply like split the two of them and say, ah, it is behaving as a species and then it's behaving as, as a social agent. No, 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 it's, the two of them are really intertwined as a species and as a social entity. And you cannot really split the, the two of them. But going, going to the, the, the last part of the questions, of course, scientists, natural scientists, have arrived to conclusions that are very problematic for, for big corporations. Let's say, or let's just finish saying oil corporations. So the conclusions of this natural science are very dangerous for these big corporations. That is why people, particularly in the United States, are not happy with the idea of climate change because the, the, the science Looks like we have a glitch with Herman. Yeah, okay. Okay, I can. Yeah, I can keep going with another question for Catalina. We speak to for Herman to come back. So, Catalina, I have a question here from Diego Campos. Also, is uh, he says out of curiosity, I want to know what about Monserrate Mountain? Was a volcano? Are there studies about polygenal records around this area that could corroborate this urban myth? No, it's a urban myth. It's, it's, it's not a volcano. <laughs> it was never a volcano. And, and geologists actually make fun of that. Um, but there are um, the longest records, palynological records. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, Herman. Dale, go, go, go. Don't worry. Uh, it won't take more than a second. Uh, the, the longest palynological records in, in North and South America are here nearby the Savannah Bogota the ones in Fukene Funza, and they have been crucial for the understanding of um, climate changes in the tropics um, through like different time scales. So if you're interested, I can give you some references, but nothing related to, to Montserrat as a volcano. Long, 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 long time ago, there was a volcano near Paipa, like a few million years ago, but that's another story. <laughs> Thanks. Herman, perhaps you would you like to finish your question, your answer? What, what I was trying to say, what my point was that curiously, the scientific research that arrived to the conclusion related to climate change got a conclusion that is politically very dangerous because in a way it forces to redefine the main energetic or an energetic matrix of capitalism or this society. So it's like scientific topics became because of their intellectual consequences, very complicated. And most of the scientists try to say, no, no, I am talking about something that is like the truth. This is science, this is neutral. But then their conclusions are really complicated for some people. People that are 
the most powerful people in those, this society. So to force and change the energetic matrix is not just a matter of science. It's a matter of social and political movement to change that because scientists have a right to a very important conclusion. Now think about the COVID. This discussion, absurd discussion in the United States, if you use the mask, or you don't use the mask, and if you don't use the mask, you are for Trump, and if you use the mask, you are for the other guys. Hey, something is happening that is mixing like sort of medical or sanitary or scientific conclusions with political topics. And so what we are in the middle right now in a sort of situation of biopolitical situation. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, I think that also links very well with uh, what I think it's probably going to be our last question in it's actually how might the global pandemic affect climate change? How will it change the trajectory of the capital, OSIN, et cetera? And then uh, I think that's mm, to all the, the panelists. And, uh, how might it aff affect indigenous communities already dealing with increasing variable climate, climate seasonality, et cetera? Oops. Last the, one again. Fine. Uh, the capital, <laughs> capital scene park, Herman can deal with that. I'm going to refer to pandemic, climate change, and indigenous communities. And there is an interesting linkage because what we observe is that uh, indigenous peoples living in the territories, I mean, are highly dependent on natural resources, and natural resources are highly dependent on climate variability. So uh, people, indigenous people living in cities, uh, depending on uh, paid salaries, um, buying things from the market, I mean, they are less aware and uh, less affected by, by changes in seasonality, changes in precipitation, and that kind of things. But what the pandemic showed is that people in the cities became highly vulnerable to the pandemic because Cities are supposed to be the source of money, um, employment, health service. And suddenly the cities became uh, no services uh, and high vulnerability to the disease. And dependence on, on money for, for, for uh, food. When people living in the territory uh, became that they have autonomy in, in terms of they have their own plantations, their own food, the knowledge to gather food from fish and that. So, so indigenous people became very much aware that having their own uh, food sovereignty uh, was uh, like a real capital. So, uh, and uh, what, what I observed, I mean, through the talk of what, what Catalina showed, that the Anthropocene, the, the Holocene as a uh, Garden of Eden, well, more, more or less a stable temperature, but I observed there was di diminution in precipitation along along the, the last millennia. Mm -hmm. And so we assume that there was like a kind of a stable weather or climate in the Amazon and then, and then in the recent decades has changed. But I, what I'm beginning to think is that always there's been a huge variation in climate and, and even the, the tectonics of the Amazon. We don't think of the Amazonia as a tectonic zone. But last year it was an earthquake in Leticia. It was very strong. It was amazed because it was amplified by the, by the clay in the soil. So, uh, so the, the pandemic, of course, is adds up to several other, other circumstances that are affecting people, so including changes in weather, uh, changes in many other things. But interestingly, uh, it leads, it uh, had taught indigenous peoples that reliance on the subsistence systems, sub subsistence systems is actually a uh, means autonomy. And that this, this reliance on subsistence system also 
requires awareness of ecological indexes that allows them to deal with that. So I... I agree. I agree. Many people say that uh, the pandemics is helping actually like the climate crisis to slow down a bit because we are flying less and we are yeah, traveling less, consuming less carbon in a way. But on the other hand, other people say that when economies start to reactivate, then we'll overcompensate the, what we, we had gained. So there's a big discussion about that. But I, I agree with Juan that the main point is like how we as society start to, to understand our sovereignty, our like the, the um, dependence on an external sources, uh, um, a weakened network, internal like network, uh, uh, forbidden rural uh, communities, forbidden uh, indigenous communities is actually putting us in a difficult situation to, to, to deal with, with climate change. So in a way, it is putting us face to face with, uh, with, uh, with problems that we have to start to solve uh, if we want to face climate change in a, in a different way. So it's like a preparation or like a simulacro <laughs> of what could be reached if we don't deal with, uh, with these uh, situations properly. So it's a good example on how um, disturbance, uh, problems are dividing and bringing society into more, even more differences and, and heterogeneous uh, and unfair situations and injustice situations. So we have to work on that if we want to deal with climate change. So it's a good opportunity to face the problem face to face. Yeah, I don't know if Herman is still here, if you'd like to add something to, uh, to I mean, I, yeah. as you know, I am not the natural scientist here, and I am living a sort of virtual Anthropocene, and I see you in a, the Holocene, virtual Holocene, because mine is very unstable, <laughs> why I stopped my video. But the thing that I would really interest me, I, I am not the person to say anything, is that this whole explosion of new virus is related or not on how it's related to climate change. I will be really happy if someone let me give me an idea or some argument or explanation and it's related to that point. I don't think so, <laughs> but it's just an opinion. It's not based on any data. I don't think so. I just think that viruses are every time, everywhere. The thing is that we are more connected and we are setting the perfect situation for the virus to spread and to succeed. But it's not that the virus without climate change was not here. I mean, I, it, but it's an opinion. I don't have any data to, to support that. <laughs> all right. So, well, I, gonna, I want to thank again to all our speakers, to Catalina Gonzalez, to Juan Alvaro, and to Herman, to Ima for being for sharing this this webinar with everybody. Uh, it was a was a very nice space for us. We we all love your, your talk. And uh, I just want to close saying that uh, this is the last one of our webinars from the webinar series that we've been uh, working on. Uh, please allow me to share. Screen. I'm trying to share right now. Uh, now I can share my screen. Sorry. Okay, let's see if I can share this one here. Okay, so this is the one, last one of our webinars. So we, we just very quickly went to four different topics, impacts on COVID-19 and wildlife, trade, health, and climate. Our second topic, topic was professional skills and 
anticipation, then we move to efficient tropical biology anticipation, and we ended up with, with the frontiers of tropical biology and conservation. Uh, I want to remind everybody that all these webinar sessions are recorded. They are available on the YouTube channel from the ATVC. This, this particular webinar will be available starting on the 30th of October. But uh, in spite of this is the last webinar series, webinar from our series, we have one last bonus, which is a very cool webinar we're going to be having on the 11th of November, a Wednesday, for, um, which is a joint collaboration between, between the ATVC, the Metropolitan Chapter, and ESA, the Ecological Society of South America, the Latin American Chapter. With a, with a webinar called The Future of a University in Latin America and the Caribbean. One special thing here is that this webinar is not uh, only for members of the ATC, so it's going to be free. So everybody is free to share this information and to share the link. It's going to be posted on the web page. So invite your colleagues, parents, friends, everybody, students who want to attend this class, bonus that will be on the webinar. So on behalf of the ATVC, I want to thank again our speakers, Juan, Catalina, and Germán, and to close by now our webinars. Have a great rest of the afternoon, a great evening, or a great morning, wherever you are right now. And goodbye to everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Juan. It was a great Bye. pleasure. Bye. Thank yeah, you Catalina. for everything. Catalina, Germán, ciao. 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 Juan, Catalina, wait a minute. Ciao. Wait, 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 Catalina, wait, wait that I want to show you something. Ow! <laughs> <laughs>